following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Welcome to our new course in which we will analyze and discuss the famous path of the Bodhisattva. The teachings that we will be discussing are very ancient and find their roots in times that are long forgotten by this humanity. The term bodhisattva is a Sanskrit word which describes a certain kind of person or a certain kind of psychology, which is far more ancient than even the Sanskrit language. So when we enter into the reception of this kind of teaching, it's good for us to keep in mind that the principles, the psychology, the science that we're discussing is far more ancient than the terms, than the words, and than the traditions that we have in these days. In this series of lectures, you will encounter a wide variety of terms, concepts, ways of looking at things, which you could relate to traditions that we know in these days, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, the Hebrew tradition, the Aztec tradition. But the fundamental root of this science, of this wisdom, is far older than any of those traditions. It is a form of wisdom which is eternal, universal, which has always been present as long as humanity has been present, as long as there has been existence, there has been this science. We call it Gnosis. But it also has other names. In the East, it's called Dharma. Dharma has many meanings. It's a Sanskrit word. It means truth. It means law. It also has a strong reference to action. Not just theory, but something that is active. Something that performs an action and derives a consequence. But the word gnosis is Greek and is normally in these times translated simply as knowledge. But the word gnosis actually refers to active knowledge like Dharma or knowledge from experience. Not just knowledge in the intellect, but knowledge that one knows because of experience, because of direct perception. You may know this word diagnosis. 
And this is a word used in medicine. To diagnose a patient is for a doctor to observe, to analyze with his perception that patient in order to derive at some analysis, some conclusion about the illness. Gnosis is the same, diagnosis. Gnosis is there because it's a perceptive science. It is a science of perception. What that means is that it is a science of consciousness. Because it is consciousness that allows us to perceive. Gnosis is not a science of intellect. Dharma is not limited merely to the intellect. Dharma or gnosis or jnana in Sanskrit is a science to awaken consciousness, to utilize consciousness and to develop it to its fullest potential. Therefore, I invite you to use your consciousness when you receive this wisdom. To listen with more than just the intellect. The intellect is useful in its place. But it isn't the totality of what makes us what we are. It's only one portion. Likewise, we have emotional center or where we have our beliefs, our feelings. And when we receive this wisdom, we should receive it with our feelings as well, with our heart. But not limit ourselves to just that. We also have our body. We have our motor center, our instinctive center, our sexual center. These other parts of our psychology and our physiology. We need to receive this wisdom there as well. Not merely in the intellect as ideas, not merely in the heart as a belief that we accept or reject, but also in our body, in our actions. To understand Gnosis in these three aspects, these three ways, helps us to understand how to understand it with the consciousness. Because the consciousness is beyond intellect. It is beyond emotion, beyond feeling. It's also beyond sensation related to the body. Your consciousness is the root of who you are. But unfortunately, the consciousness has become trapped in suffering, in pain subject to what the Buddhists call the wheel of samsara. And this wheel is the wheel of life and death, to which all of us are subject. And because of that, we're tossed about by forces that we don't perceive, afflicted with all manner of suffering and pain, with very little power to control it. This is why this particular science is so critical. Dharma, or gnosis, indicates with precision the manner in which any person, in any place, at any time, can transform themselves, can learn how to utilize the consciousness in order to awaken and thereby conquer suffering. The means through which this wisdom has been expressed throughout time, throughout space, has varied according to the psychology of the humanity in a given time or place. In the East, this root wisdom, this Gnostic wisdom, has been expressed as Buddhism when the Buddha Shakyamuni came and gave his teaching. It has been expressed in Hinduism with all the great teachers that have arrived in the land of India to teach this Gnostic doctrine. It came in the Middle East through many teachers such as Moses, Muhammad, Jesus. 
and all the prophets. It has also come in the West, in South America, through Quetzalcoatl, through many other teachers, such as Samael and Vior, all of whom have taught and delivered the same wisdom. Yet, in each case, that light, that science, has a little different color, has a little different flavor. But in its root, it's the same. That light, that wisdom, is Gnostic wisdom, whether you call it Aztec mysticism or Buddhist. In its root, it's the same. The transmitter of that light is the one light, which we call in the Western tradition, Christ. or Christos, the cosmic Christ who is the light of the world, the sun king, Amun-Ra, the solar god of the Egyptians, the solar god of the Romans, of the Greeks, Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, Apollo, Avalokiteshvara, Chinrezi. All of these names refer to the same entity, the same intelligence, who is not a person, who is an energy, a root primordial wisdom, a root primordial intelligence, which is beyond form, which is beyond matter, which is beyond energy, but is the root of them all. Christ illuminates and provides life to everything that exists. The fire in the heart of any sun, in the heart of any living creature, that fire in the heart of any atom is the Christ. Without that light, there is no life. And this is why the ancients worshipped the sun. The esoteric meaning there is that the sun is the giver of life. But that sun is inside. That sun is inside all the atoms that make up the body that you're sitting in. And it's the same light that gives you the consciousness. It gives you the capacity to perceive. But unfortunately, we perceive in the wrong way because our consciousness has become trapped. Nonetheless, that light continues to radiate on the ancient Kabbalah, the tree of life, we see that light at the top of the tree. The Ein Sof Or, the ray of creation, which when it manifests the first time is that supernal triangle, the first three spheres on the tree of life, which we call the solar logos. Logos means word in Greek. That supreme light is the cause, the reason, the support for everything that lives and breathes. It expresses its knowledge, its wisdom. But humanity, beings, creatures, even the gods, only receive that light through the filter of their mind. We, of course, as we are, are in darkness. We rarely, if ever, see that light. Very difficult for us to see that light in its pure form. Because of that, this light, the Christ, which in its root essence is pure love, manifests itself through messengers who we call prophets or avatars. They are, in essence, light bulbs. Light bulbs which transmit that light. So if that light, the Christ, were electricity, which it is, a master, an avatar, a Buddha, a god, a prophet, would be the light bulb which transmits that light. 
But of course, there are different qualities of light bulbs. All the light bulbs have different capacities. Capacities to manage energy. Some can only manage so much. So they deliver the light according to their capacity, according to their flavor. And this is what we call religions. Buddhism is the light is expressed through a particular psychology, according to a particular need. Christianity is the same light through a different bulb. The Greek mysteries, the Roman mysteries, all of which had their messengers who delivered that light, taught that light. The most profound, the most powerful, the most capable transmitters of that light are, of course, the most awakened beings of all. Those who are capable <clears throat> of harnessing that force, the energy, and transmitting it in as pure a form as possible. And these we call bodhisattvas. These are beings who are different. The solar logos, the cosmic Christ, in the Gnostic tradition, is seen as having three primary aspects. These are, as I mentioned, the first three spheres on the tree of life, or the Kabbalah. They are called in Hebrew, Keter, Chokmah, and Bina. Keter is the first. This word means crown. This is the crown of life mentioned in the Bible. Keter is the father, the root wisdom, the ancient of days, a terribly divine intelligence, consciousness, energy. The second aspect, or the second logos, is called chokmah. This Hebrew word means wisdom. And the third is called Bina. And this Hebrew word means understanding or intelligence. These three aspects are one. They are a trinity, a trimurti. One thing with three faces, with three aspects. They express through one or the other aspect according to the need. It takes a lot of meditation in order to understand this three in one. The intellect will struggle. What's important to note at this juncture is that the second logos, the second aspect of this one thing, it's called chokmah, which means wisdom. In other words, the cosmic Christ, the three in one, the solar logos, expresses itself as that wisdom. And when the light of the Christ descends, it is that wisdom, chokmah, which is expressing itself in order to assist beings, in order to elaborate creation in order to deliver its love. The way it does that in the most profound sense, the most potent, powerful, and pervading way is through its messengers, those bodhisattvas, the prophets. They are incarnations of that light. In other words, the mind, the I, the self, has been cleaned out of that person. All that remains is the glass of the bulb, perfectly clear, no sense of I, no selfishness. And what remains is simply the light, which expresses. A beautiful example of that is Jesus of Nazareth. 
Jesus, Yeshua, which means Savior, was a human person who worked on himself so intensely that he purified himself of all that is subjective, of all sense of self, and became the perfect reflection of that cosmic light. Chokmah, wisdom. That's why we call that light the sun. S-O-N. And this is why Jesus often spoke of himself as the sun. This is related to Chokmah. The sun is the child which delivers the qualities of the father and mother, which expresses those qualities. The word bodhisattva is Sanskrit. Bodhi means awakened. It means wisdom. It also means intelligence. Do you see the relationship? Chokmah in Hebrew means wisdom. Bina in Hebrew means intelligence. Bodhi in Sanskrit means intelligence, awakened, wisdom. You see there, these are two distinct traditions in the minds of people of this time. But in their roots, they come from the same source. Bodhisattva. Sattva is Sanskrit also. It also has different meanings. But when combined with bodhi, sattva means essence of. So bodhisattva means essence of wisdom. We are fortunate to still have some portion of the wisdom teachings of many great bodhisattvas, such as Moses, Krishna, Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus, and many others, many of whom were never known by humanity, but nonetheless, have contributed to try to assist humanity. The teachings that have been delivered to this humanity over the course of the last few thousand years have all been delivered according to the needs of the age, the needs of the psychology of the people who receive it. We are now in the age of what's called Kali Yuga, the dark age. Kali is the consumer, the destroyer, the goddess who destroys in Hinduism, who consumes the goddess of the abyss, in other words. So this Kali Yuga is really the age of the abyss, when the abyss is consuming humanity. This is very easy to see. What we call human beings are little more than animals who are driven entirely by desires. So this age of Kali Yuga is a very dark time. Many great messengers have come to try to deliver the wisdom, the Dharma, to assist humanity. Some have come in the East, some have come in the West. Some have been known publicly, and many have not. Nonetheless, the intention is always the same, to help, to assist to ease the pain, to help beings come to the light. Light and consciousness are the same. In the same way that wherever you find life, you find consciousness. Wherever you find light, there is consciousness. So that metaphor is not really a metaphor. It's factual. And as we've mentioned in other lectures, quantum physicists are discovering the truth of this, that light has intelligence. The wisdom teachings have been delivered according to the needs of humanity. 
And there have been many forms of religion. Of course, we know well that humanity is always fighting over these forms, killing each other in so-called the name of God or the name of love. Of course, to kill one another for religion has nothing to do with religion. The word religion actually comes from religare, which means to unite. So how are you going to unite if you're killing people? But these religions, these wisdom teachings, have been given according to the needs of the age. We can look at a Buddhist model of teachings in order to understand them. And we would say that there are three primary forms of religion. In Sanskrit, these are called yanas. Yana means vehicle. And a vehicle, of course, like a car, is a technology that you use to get from one place to another. <clears throat> so too are the three yanas, the three vehicles of the Dharma. And again, when I say Dharma, I don't just mean Eastern traditions. I mean all religion. Because all teachings can be organized according to these three vehicles. The first, of course, must be a foundational path an introductory path, a teaching that can accommodate any person in order to provide them with the information they need to go further. So what we would call a foundational path in the Eastern traditions is called Shravakayana. From the words Shravaka, which means hearer, someone who hears, someone who listens. And yana means vehicle. So the shravaka yana has been misnamed hinayana. The term hinayana is actually derogatory. It's impolite. We should use the word shravaka yana, or just call it the foundational path. This is much more respectful and indicates its true function. The foundational path is that form of religion, that form of dharma, which teaches to any person the very basics of spirituality, the very basics of how to understand the consciousness. In Buddhism, this includes things like the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths express the basis of life, that life is suffering. This is the first thing any spiritual aspirant must understand deeply, not just in the intellect, but by experience. To understand the nature of karma, to understand the nature of suffering, is the purpose of the foundational path. It's in this level of work that an aspirant is taught how to meditate, to concentrate, how to pray how to self-observe, how to be aware, how to be mindful. But all of these things, mindfulness, self-observation, self-remembering, meditation, prayer, are all with one purpose, to comprehend the nature of suffering, to comprehend the nature of karma. Karma is a law which exists throughout time and space. If there were no karma, there would be no existence. Because things exist, we know there is karma. Because karma simply says, if there is an action, there is a consequence. And if there is a consequence, it was created by a cause, some action. So the law of action and consequence is the whole point, the whole purpose of the studies of the foundational path. But not merely to study that intellectually, theoretically, but to find the causes of suffering in oneself. This is the purpose. In our Gnostic tradition, 
We do this in many ways by emphasizing the need to self-observe, to analyze oneself, one's own behavior, one's own feelings, thoughts, actions, and in doing so, to see the consequences of them. Not just to observe mechanically, but to observe in order to gain comprehension, understanding, wisdom. The understanding is this. When we act, we create results. It's clear that we do not understand this because we continue to act in harmful ways. Each one of us, if we are sincere, if we sincerely analyze our own mind, we will find that probably within the last few hours, we have had some quality or another which has arisen in our mind which is harmful. It could be pride, it could be shame, it could be lust, it might be anger, it might be envy, or jealousy, or resentment, or fear, or gluttony, or greed. There's a multitude of qualities that can arise in our mind which create suffering for us and for others. If we truly understood that every thought we have has a consequence, if we really understood that every feeling that arises in your heart produces a result, do you really think we would persist in generating the feelings and thoughts that we have? If we really understood that, when we feel anger towards another person, we actually hurt them. Not physically, but psychologically. When we feel jealousy for another person, we hurt ourselves. When we feel envy, we hurt everyone. When we feel pride, when we think from pride, when we act from pride, we harm Therefore, it's necessary for everyone to constantly analyze the mind from moment to moment, to always watch the mind. It's the mind, or in other words, the ego, which has trapped our consciousness, our own light, in darkness, and causes us to see things in the wrong way we then believe that our sense of self is real, that our sense, our feeling of pride is real, and we want to feed that. We want to feel better about ourselves by getting an admirable job, by having an admirable role in life, by having money or status, by getting something that someone else has that we want, which is covetousness. But pride is in the root of these things. Or perhaps we just have fear fear of poverty, fear of loneliness, fear of rejection. So we act in order to qualify, to satisfy those sensations, physical sensations, emotional sensations, and intellectual sensations. All that activity creates karma. Every time we act from pride, we think from pride, we feel and indulge in the sensations of pride, we create suffering, we create karma. Therefore, this foundational path has been expressed universally in all times and places. And this is why all the great religions emphasize moral purity, sanctity, the need to eliminate negative emotions. Negative emotions doesn't just mean anger, or lust, or hate. It also means pride, which often feels very good. It also means gluttony, which always seeks to feel good. It also means lust, which always seeks to feel good. 
These are negative emotions. They are qualities of emotional energy which vibrate in the astral body, which are negative, which are harmful. So we see in any religion an emphasis on the need to change our psychology, to understand the law of action and consequence. As the Bible says, every man will reap what he sows. In other words, as you act, you will receive. According to your actions, you are given what you deserve. When we really comprehend that, we can start to begin ready, to become ready for the next level of instruction. When we really see, sort of consciously comprehend how our own ego creates karma, how our own pride can make not only us suffer, but the ones we love suffer. A parent who loves their child, loves with a kind of love that's beyond just the intellect. It's even beyond description in many ways. There's a love there that's so deep. But if that parent listens to their pride and begins to teach their child in accordance with their pride, they may push that child to develop itself in a way that's against the child's own nature. For example, many parents, in order to feel good about themselves, to feel that they've done a good job as a parent, want their children to be rich. Not for the benefit of the child so much, but for their own pride. Or want their child to be a doctor or a politician. So there's a mixture. There's the love for the child, but there's also that ego, which wants its reflection to be seen as beautiful. And this is an illusion, and it's a root of suffering. But the one who takes that seriously, this science, this dharma, and recognizes that it's our own ego that creates suffering for ourselves and others, something new can be created. Some new quality is there, ready to emerge. <clears throat> but only if we know how to do it. And all the religions emphasize this too. It's called love. It's called compassion. In Sanskrit, it's called bodhicitta. As I mentioned, bodhi means mind, wisdom. I mean, bodhi means wisdom, intelligence, understanding. Chitta means mind. When that bodhi, the understanding, the wisdom, the intelligence, perceives the cause of suffering in us, that bodhi can be born in our own mind. That is bodhicitta, that is awakened mind, intelligence, understanding, wisdom. That birth, even the aspiration to give birth to that kind of love and compassion for others, is the beginning of the next stage of dharma or the next major form of religions. We would call this the greater path <clears throat> or greater vehicle. And in Hinduism or in um, Sanskrit, it's called Mahayana. Mahayana. Maha means great. And yana means vehicle or path. So the distinguishing characteristic of Mahayana teachings is compassion. Conscious love.
this is the differentiating factor. But there's one more. In other words, bodhicitta. The second differentiating factor of any teaching which can be grouped as a greater vehicle is the direct experience of emptiness, of shunyata, the absolute. These two factors, these two aspects go hand in hand with each other. Without a strong experiential understanding of the nature of emptiness, then compassion will remain weak. Why? Real compassion, real love, bodhicitta, is that awakened mind, the wisdom mind, that intelligence. But that wisdom, the bodhi, is the light of this solar logos, the supernal triangle, keter hokma bina. That is the ray of creation. But that light emerges from the absolute because of love. The essence of bodhicitta is the love of the Christ. The love that Christ has for suffering creatures. That love emerges from the vast absolute, the emptiness, in which there is no self. There is no I. There is no ego. There's no suffering. The absolute is beyond suffering. It is pure, absolute happiness. From that point of view, a being who has merged with that light, who knows the absolute cognizance of existence, perceives suffering creatures and feels tremendous love and concern for all the suffering entities which are below in the mud and the muck. That creature, that intelligence, that being can only have that point of view because that being understands the emptiness of self-nature. The beings who are stuck in suffering suffer because they mistakenly believe that the I is real. Each one of us mistakenly believes that the sense of self we have is real. But if we learn to meditate, if we learn to observe ourselves, if we learn how to utilize the consciousness, we can have the direct experience of the emptiness of that self. The pride that gives us the sense of self actually does not exist. It's an illusion. It's false. It is a lie. But we believe it. The only reason it's sustained there is because it has our energy trapped in it. The goal of the meditator, then, is to break that vessel, the ego, to free the consciousness and thus free themselves of karma, of suffering. That comes through comprehension and the foundational work. It comes through compassion, knowing that we have within ourselves root causes which will cause others to suffer. That compassion, that love for other people, for other beings, for other creatures, gives tremendous inspiration to change. But that inspiration to change, the motivation, is fed the more we understand the nature of the emptiness of the self. Because then we can see, not only are we mistaken in our sense of self, 
but so are others. Within this tradition of Mahayana, the practitioner, the student of a given religion, has to be gathering experiential knowledge of these truths to experience it, to know it. This is not intellectual. It is not a belief. It's a matter of personal, conscious knowledge. But the one who really comprehends the terror of karma, the true power of the law of action and consequence, which is being fed and sustained by our own ego. That person begins to realize they need a faster way. Because moving slowly from lifetime to lifetime, there's so much danger. Because that sense of I is so hypnotic. That sense of self is so fascinating that we have a very difficult time staying on top of it. In Gnosis, we understand that we have within us what's called an essence. In Zen, they call this burata. In traditional Buddhism, it's called tathagatagarbha, which means the seed or the embryo of the awakened one, the Buddha nature. In other words, this Buddha nature is our own consciousness, which is an embryo. It is a seed that has within itself the potential to become a Buddha, to become fully awake, beyond suffering. But it has to be grown. Unfortunately, it is trapped in the I this false sense of self. It's the consciousness itself. Our own consciousness. But that consciousness is very small, like a baby. It's not well developed. And unfortunately, 97% of it is trapped in the ego, in all those discursive elements like pride, lust, envy, anger, greed. We need to free the essence, to extract it from the ego. This is why we need to meditate, to learn how to work with the consciousness, to separate ourselves from the false sense of self, and experience the truth of the nature of mind. That nature is called clear light in tantric Buddhism. The clear light is consciousness unmodified, unfiltered, pure in its original state. All the Buddhists state that the original nature of mind is pure, clear, empty, and open, without self-nature. And Samael and Vior stated the same thing. The mind in its natural state is pure and calm like a lake, and it can reflect all the contents of the universe there's no self in that. There is consciousness. There is true individuality. There is an individual, but it is not self in the way we think of self. It's a kind of self nature that is beyond self. It's beyond this limited cage that we suffer within. The need to free the essence the consciousness becomes very strong in the one who really comprehends karma and the one who's generating a lot of compassion from their understanding of karma. 
they begin to realize they need a faster means, something more effective, more penetrating, deeper, to more quickly eradicate the causes of suffering so that they will stop making other people suffer and stop making themselves suffer. That secret path, that higher path, has many names, but it is what we would call the esoteric side of the teaching. Christianity has had an esoteric tradition, which is now mostly lost. In Buddhism, it's been well preserved in Tibet and in some other countries. It's known by several names. Vajrayana. Vajra means diamond, indestructible. So it is the diamond path, the diamond vehicle, the indestructible vehicle. And a Vajra, is, it means thunderbolt, lightning. Indra, the god of Hinduism, uses a Vajra as his weapon. The symbol of Vajrayana is a thunderbolt. And you may see lamas, like the Dalai Lama, with a Vajra in one hand and a bell in the other. And these symbolize method and wisdom, two complementary aspects of practice, which advance the development of bodhicitta. Vajra also indicates the phallus, the sexual organ, because that is the creative force, the creative energy, very active energy that the practitioner needs to harness in order to eliminate the causes of suffering. Vajrayana is also a tantric teaching. It is tantrism. And tantra, meaning continuum or stream or flow, is that science where the energy of the vajra is harnessed and utilized. So vajrayana can also be called tantrayana, the vehicle of the continuum. Vajrayana can also be called mantrayana, mantra is a sacred word, a word of power. So really, the, the way that the Tibetans translate mantrayana is very interesting. In the works of Tsongkhapa, who was an incarnation of the Buddha Shakyamuni, he calls mantrayana the vehicle of the secret word. And if you know anything about masonry or Western occultism, you know that the lost word, the secret word, is very significant. So the same tradition exists in the East. This vehicle of Vajrayana, Tantrayana, Mantrayana, it's all one thing. It is a science of transforming energy. A mantra, a word, is a vibration. A vajra is an energy. Tantra is a stream of energy. So in each of these titles, we're pointing to the same essential foundation. In traditional Buddhism, vajrayana is organized in different schools and different groups and different levels, depending on which school you look at. So generally, there are four classes of tantrism in ascending order. The one who enters into the Vajrayana teachings, this diamond path, does so motivated by bodhicitta, by compassion. This is a very important thing to think about. The one who's really given the secrets, the science, the wisdom of this highest aspect is given them because of compassion. Unfortunately, in these times, all the students 
especially in the West, want to enter immediately into the Vajrayana teaching. As soon as they hear of Buddhism, they immediately want the highest tantra. They want to skip everything before that and immediately receive all the secret, most high aspects of the teaching. Do you know what we call that? We call it pride. And it's unfortunate. It's understandable. In their way, people that have that intention, that motivation, that desire, want to transform themselves. This is a good thing. But that ambition needs to be tempered with realism, to be realistic about oneself. The stages of the path are presented with good purpose. In the Gnostic tradition, we teach all of these levels of the path, but in a very synthesized form. If you study the books of Samael on Vior, you'll find practices which apply to all of these levels of the teaching. Meditation practices from each of the three aspects can be found in the books. Self-observation practices can be found. Means of transforming energy can be found. And each of these apply to different levels. This is not to say that those who are studying the highest aspect of the teaching, like Vajrayana, very difficult meditation practices, are better than anyone else. They are not. We're all equal. We're all trapped in suffering. But we each have different needs. The fact remains that these degrees of instruction are for everyone at the time it's appropriate. In this Kali Yuga, the karma of humanity has become so heavy, so intense, the suffering is so strong that those conscious intelligences which manage this teaching from superior levels of existence have made the determination it's time to open the doors to the entire teaching because time is short. The karma that hangs over the head of humanity is so heavy that these great compassionate beings made the decision. Let them have everything so they can use it while there's time if they want it. And if they don't, we respect that. The truth is that in any given meditation practice, we can move through all three levels like that in one practice. We can utilize aspects of each, as each level of teaching because they are just different ways of looking at the mind, different ways of working with the consciousness. There's not one that's better than another. They are all important. They all make one thing. Likewise, as just as students each have their level in which they need to work, instructors also have their level. You may investigate the Gnostic wisdom in a given place and find that the focus is entirely in foundational aspects of the teaching. Don't criticize them. Those instructors are teaching according to their own understanding and according to the needs of the student. As practitioners of Dharma, we should always respect practitioners at whatever level they work. But understand one thing. There's a great difference in the result of those practitioners who remain in one level or another. And this happens. Because of the heavy karma of, of humanity, some human beings, some people, will approach a teaching, let's say the foundational aspect, and remain in that teaching and become attached to it. They don't go beyond. Because of this, they limit their own development. That level of instruction can only take you so far. The result, 
the, the person who's practicing in that level, maybe even stopping themselves in that level, is called a shravaka. As we said, this is shravakayana. And the word shravaka means listener, hearer. This is someone who's hearing the teaching, listening to the dharma, but who has not accomplished it. Someone who hears it, believes it, follows it, but has not accomplished it. The person who's following and studying in the greater path, trying to comprehend uh, compre uh, compassion, bodhicitta, meditating, transforming themselves according to that level of instruction, is called the pratyeka in Sanskrit. And a pratyeka, pratyeka means solitary. Solitary. But the one who takes full advantage of the Mahayana and goes beyond can start to be called a bodhisattva. But this term has very specific limitations, very specific aspects. In Gnosis, we go a little deeper than the traditional Buddhist explanation of these three yanas. Because in the development of the consciousness, that development is not limited to the type of matter that we work with now. In order to really become a channel, a vehicle of bodhicitta. That bodhicitta has to be well-developed. Bodhicitta has different aspects. Two primary aspects, absolute and relative. Absolute bodhicitta is divided into two. First is the recognition that all existing beings have Buddha nature have God inside, have the divine in them. We don't grasp that because we treat other people badly. If we really understood that within each person is the seed of a Buddha, an angel, is a portion of God, we would respect them, treat them in a good way with love. But we don't. The second part of absolute bodhicitta is the recognition of the void, the emptiness in all things. Comprehension, experience of the absolute. So absolute bodhicitta is comprehension of the absolute and Buddha nature combined. And really, the one who has that is a Buddha, someone who's awake fully. The second part of a second kind of bodhicitta is called relative. And of course, by relative, we mean it's in a process of development. But this also has two aspects. The first is aspirational. When we hear about bodhicitta, when we hear about selfless love, compassion for others. This is a very inspiring thing, very beautiful, very virtuous. And we may feel in our heart a longing to know that, to become that, to become compassionate spontaneously. The aspiration to develop bodhicitta is this first aspect. It's just the longing to develop true cognizant love. The second is application. Many people have the aspiration to be loving. They may be Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or Gnostic and may have the, the idea that to love all beings is beautiful, and they may aspire to that, but they might not act on it. 
It's a very different thing to begin acting on the basis of conscious love, to want to actually do it, to realize it. So the application of bodhicitta comes in levels. These levels have different names in different traditions. In traditional Buddhism, the application of bodhicitta is described as having six major forms. In other words, to be a really compassionate person, to really, truly renounce your own sense of self and to serve other people comes in the form of six primary aspects. These are called paramitas. And paramita is a Sanskrit word which means perfection. So we can say the six perfections. You'd be interested to know that the Master Samael and Vior spoke of the paramitas. But at the time he was teaching, the texts, the scriptures that were relevant to the paramitas were not translated. And he spoke of this in a lecture that he wished that he had access to those so he could work with students to understand the paramitas. Now we have them, fortunately. So there are a number of scriptures that we can draw on in order to comprehend the paramitas. The most famous is commonly or popularly called the way of life of the bodhisattva, or the bodhisattva way of life. It's called the bodhicharya vatara, is the name of that scripture. The six perfections are virtuous activity. These are not just ideas. They aren't just theories. These are ways of behaving. And when a practitioner has perfected those six, they have become a full enlightened Buddha. So these perfections, these paramitas, are in themselves the path to becoming a Buddha. And these are presented according to what are called bhumis in Sanskrit, which means ground or level. Usually these are given as 10 levels. We're going to talk about those in later lectures. And we're going to talk in detail about the paramitas in subsequent lectures of this course. But for the purposes of today's lecture, understand that the six paramitas are the way we work through activity to perfect our bodhicitta, to perfect our compassion, our conscious love. In Gnosis, we look at the same thing, but from a little bit different angle. Looking at it from the point of view of matter and energy, we can say that practitioners of the lower forms of religion, not lower, but foundational levels, may not develop bodhicitta but they still can develop the bodies of the soul. Students of religions who would be more or less centered in the foundational path, or more or less centered in the greater path, can still receive the teachings of sexual transmutation, alchemy or tantra, in order to elaborate and create the bodies of the soul, the solar astral body, solar mental body, the solar causal body. Yet, even achieving those works, astral, mental, and causal, they may not develop bodhicitta. And the, the aspirant practitioner who works with the science of transmutation, scientific chastity, can build and create those internal vehicles what in Tibetan Buddhism is known as the illusory body. But do it without bodhicitta, without compassion. And the end result is a pratyeka Buddha, a solitary realizer, 
or in other words, a nirvani. This is the person who's awakened consciousness to a degree, who has developed powers, who has the capacity to travel in the superior worlds and the inferior worlds, because they've developed in themselves vehicles, bodies, which give them that capacity to work consciously outside the physical body. But yet, without bodhicitta, they remain in that level. They remain what can be called the selfish gods. If you've studied the Mahabharata, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, you see the gods are fighting with each other. The gods are jealous. The gods have wars. They have pride. This is because they are pratyekas. They are gods, Buddhas, who still have ego, who still have an eye, who remain attached to a sense of self. Here we arrive at the profound difference between two significant paths. An aspirant who's working on their karma, who's working on their consciousness in order to comprehend nature, is working to transform themselves. That transformation is due to the understanding of karma and due to the use of energy to change that energy and use it in a different way. Specifically, the sexual energy. When any aspirant has advanced in the levels of initiation through the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth degrees, these are major mysteries related to serpents of fire or kundalini, at that fifth degree, they're presented with a choice. But let's understand the context. The first degree is related to the physical body. And to acquire that initiation, the practitioner has to be in absolute chastity, physically. Meaning they do not spill the sexual energy. They contain and harness that force in order to use that energy to transform themselves physically and psychologically and spiritually. And this is only possible by working with a spouse. In Tibetan Buddhism, this is called karma mudra, which is, means action seal. And that is the science of the highest tantra. Yet, that specific knowledge is known in the other forms, Mahayana and Shravakayana. So you do find practitioners in these other forms that acquire these initiations. So the first degree is related to the physical body. The second related to the vital body or ethereal body. The third to the astral body, to emotions. The fourth to the mental body, to the mind, to the intellect. And the fifth, to the body of will, the causal body. These vehicles are how we act to create results. When we're here in our physical body acting, we have physical energy, we have sexual energy, we have emotional energy, we have mental energy, and we have energy of will. And all five of those we're using from moment to moment and we're creating consequences. We're creating karma. If we're acting in the right way, we're creating dharma, which are good results. So whichever level of the teaching we're working with, we need to grasp that. The person who ascends through these initiations is bringing the creative fire of hokmah, bina, and keter, into themselves through transmutation. The forces of Chokmah, the Christ, the Son, descends through Bina, Shiva Shakti, the Holy Spirit, that fire which descends on the apostles in the book of Acts and illuminates them. That fire is delivered through the sphere of Yasod, 
the ethereal body, which is related to our, the superior part of our physical body. It's the body of energy, the body of chi. And that ethereal body has four aspects. The lower two are related with metabolism, calories, and reproduction, all the physical functions of the body. And the higher two are related with perception. Those forces of chokmah, wisdom, are received by all the bodies, all these aspects, but primarily, centrally, through yasod, the ninth sphere. Don't get lost. I'm getting somewhere. I know it's a lot. The point is, according to how we use our energy, we become. If we use our energies in harmful ways, we acquire karma, and we degenerate. Look at humanity. How is humanity using the energies they have? To feed lust, to feed hate, to feed pride. The result is humanity is degenerating faster and faster. Life is not getting easier. We like to think it is. We have these ideals about technology and whatever. Life is not getting easier. Look sincerely at the suffering of the world. Look past what the media is telling us, what our books and movies and TV are telling us. Look at the facts of what's happening. Broaden your view and see how you are contributing to that through your own actions, through your own use of energy. The root of the transformation of energy is sexual. It's the sexual energy that gives us life, that gives us continuity. That's the meaning of tantra, continuity, that stream of forces, which comes from Hokmah, through Bina, into Yesod, into our sexual force, it gives us the capacity to perceive Someone who is a dedicated fornicator, who very actively ejaculates their sexual energy, releases that from the body, begins to suffer degeneration of perception, loss of dream memory, sicknesses, illnesses in the body, and the mind, and the heart. Those who acquire chastity who save and conserve that energy and transform it, awaken. They acquire new forms of perception, clairvoyance, astral travel, very strong dream recall, the ability to be awake outside of the physical body. These all come from chastity. So that transformation of energy in combination with the understanding of karma, in combination with working with a spouse, is what gives us the vehicle, the means, to advance through these initiations. When we arrive at the moment the, towards the ascension, the, the completion of that fifth degree related to our body of willpower, we're presented with a choice. This is not just a theory. This is an initiation that happens in the consciousness. And the choice is this. Is that initiate going to continue working little by little on the ego to pay karma slowly over time, to pay it little by little on what's called the spiral path, the nirvanic path, the path of the pratyekas? Or will that initiate take the path of the bodhisattva, the direct path, There are some very major distinctions between these two. The first thing to understand is anyone who's acquired that level of development has awakened a small percentage of consciousness, has developed internal bodies for themselves, and in the internal worlds, that person's consciousness, the spirit, is called a Buddha. It does not mean that the physical person is a Buddha. It means that their innermost, chesed, atman, has become a Buddha, is awake, 
has merged with the divine soul, the buddhi, and can express the wisdom through that vehicle, the person, the physical person. Because of this, Blavatsky, the founder of theosophy, called that person a bodhisattva. This is not accurate. A bodhisattva is one who has acquired that same degree of development, has awakened consciousness in the physical world, the etheric world, the astral, the mental, and the causal worlds. In other words, all the way to the sixth dimension, this person is awake to a certain degree, has consciousness to a certain degree. In other words, they've entered nirvana. They experience nirvana. But the bodhisattva because that bodhicitta is so strong, because their compassion is so strong, they renounce it. The bodhisattva renounces their powers, renounces the happiness of nirvana, and chooses to stay with humanity to help. So the difference, the difference there is very important. The initiate who chooses to take the spiral path decides to keep their powers, to keep their access to nirvana so that they can continue to experience that joy of having a percentage of themselves free from suffering. where the bodhisattva, the walker of the straight path, renounces it. Think about that. Right now, we are in darkness. We suffer. We're tossed about by karma. We don't know what's going to happen. Death is there at any moment to take us. Illness, sickness, and death at any instant, can strike us like lightning. We have no certainty. We have a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. And our karma is constantly ripening. We're always having problems. We're never quite getting to the goals we set. Our loved ones are sick and dying or are afflicted by their own forms of suffering, and there seems to be nothing we can do. Now imagine if you were to awaken your consciousness, and you developed the ability to go out of your physical body and talk with the gods, to talk with the Buddhas, to talk with Jesus, to acquire direct instruction and intelligence from beings that exist in the superior worlds, to investigate your karma directly, to see your past lives, to know what's going to happen. Could you renounce that? Could you, because of love for other beings and other creatures, walk away from having the powers of clairvoyance, clairaudience, astral travel, remembrance of past lives? Could you just walk away because people suffer and they need you? That is bodhicitta. That is the true heart of the highest form of teaching that exists. Because the Christ is love. The Christ is cognizant love, conscious love, that comes in order to assist, to help, to bring those who suffer out of suffering. The Pratyeka Buddhas cannot incarnate the Christ because they remain selfish. They seek to retain that happiness of nirvana, the pleasure of having powers, and thus the Christ will not enter them. They remain as Buddhas in their level, and they teach their doctrine in their level. They are not bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is revolutionary. Bodhisattva renounces their own self. 
their own well-being, their own needs, their own desires, in order to help others. This is not an easy thing to do. Because as soon as a person chooses that direct path, they then have the responsibility to pay the entirety of their karma very fast. We're suffering now because we have karma. And that means we suffer now because we're just experiencing the results of all of our previous activities. Whatever we are now is because of what we've done in the past. But that karma is being applied little by little because the one in us, our own inner guru, has compassion on us and wants to help us come out. And if all of our karma was given to us at once, we would be obliterated. We couldn't take it. But the bodhisattva has to take it. Remember Jesus when he takes that cross in the Gospels and how heavy that is and how much he suffers that cross is a symbol of karma. The burden that the initiate has to carry to pay what they owe. Regarding that, let me read to you a quote from the Master Samael on Lior. And this is from his book, The Pisces Sophia Unveiled. And in this passage, you can clearly see the nature of this teaching, the nature of the Bodhisattva's path, and how it encompasses the Mahayana and the Shravakayana, that all the paths are united in one. He says this, We must liberate and emancipate ourselves from the law of causality. We can make the great jump only by awakening and developing the consciousness. It is necessary for the bodhicitta, which means the auric embryo, the awakened consciousness, to fall into the illuminated void. Incidentally, that void is the absolute, the emptiness. Only thus can the bodhicitta be free from the world of relativity. The world of relativity is the world of combinations and of duality. The universal machine of relativity is based on the law of cosmic causality. The law of cosmic causality is the same as the law of karma. We can submerge ourselves in the illuminated void by means of the great jump. Thus, and only thus, can we liberate ourselves from the law of karma. The world of relativity is based on constant duality and therefore on the chain of causes and effects. We must break chains in order to submerge ourselves within the illuminated void. The illuminated void, the absolute, is the emptiness itself. And it's bodhicitta which gives us the capacity to reach that. It's compassion. It's love. Because in its essence, the absolute, its manifestation is that. It is love. When we understand how fragile we are, even the little bit of good quality that we have is easily overwhelmed by our own negativities. And we can observe that in ourselves and in our own daily efforts. It's much more common for us to feel negatively towards others than to feel positively, to feel true selfless love for someone else. So there are ways for us to learn that to transform ourselves. It's essential that students of Gnosis directly understand bodhicitta and develop it. In fact, about this issue, the Master Samael on Vior stated something very clear. I'll read you this quote. The one who does not possess the bodhicitta, even when he has created the superior existential bodies of the being, is still unconscious and absurd. 
This is how important bodhicitta is. It is the entire basis upon which final and absolute liberation can be achieved. Without bodhicitta, without conscious, cognizant love, which expresses the will of Christ, liberation is impossible. It can only be temporary. The nirvanis, the pratyekas, the shravakas, experience nirvana. They acquire a certain percentage of liberation. They experience a certain degree of freedom or happiness. But they are still bound by karma. They still have ego. Therefore, their realizations are temporary. Particularly when you see how heavy karma is, how pervasive the ego is, you can recognize that the power of a Prateka Buddha to remain floating above suffering is very limited because karma is very heavy. This is why in the traditions of the different world mythologies and religions, we see gods and awakened beings falling back into suffering all the time. So we cannot rely simply on developing virtue or simply on developing the solar bodies. These do not guarantee anything, but bodhicitta does. Bodhicitta is the beautiful flower, which can be born in the heart of any person who develops it. Whether you're single or married, you can develop bodhicitta. And that power can sustain you through any experience if you use it. I will recommend two practices to you you can begin to use today. In addition to developing your continuity of awareness, to learning how to be constantly mindful of your mind, to watch your thoughts and feelings, when you get up in the morning, <clears throat> realize how fortunate you are to have your body still. Without your physical body, you could not acquire what you need to acquire in order to complete this work. <clears throat> and then generate in yourself the aspiration to be a good person, to become a better person, to discover and experience bodhicitta in yourself. There are numerous prayers that you can use to give you inspiration, to help you develop that quality of conscious love. You can recite and meditate on the passage from Corinthians where Paul writes about the nature of love. It's a beautiful expression of conscious love. You can also use the prayer of St. Francis, which is another beautiful expression of love and service. You probably know that one. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. I, these, uh, these prayers are available on the website at GnosticTeachings.org in the forum. You can also use a passage from the book I mentioned earlier, which is the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And it's five parts. And it begins, may I be a guard for those who are protectorless, a guide for those who journey on the road. For those who wish to go across the water, may I be a boat, a raft, a bridge. That passage, read in its entirety, that's just an excerpt, can help you to start to feel the sense of bodhicitta, to develop the aspiration. But then you have to start acting on it. So do this prayer in the morning. Meditate. Meditate on the passage. Meditate on bodhicitta. Then during the day, do your, mindful, your practices to remain mindful and self-observing, to watch every action that you perform, even the smallest thought. And here's the second practice. At night, review your day. 
But review your day from this point of view. You want to meditate, close your eyes, relax, don't have any other distractions around, be quiet. Look at your day like it's a movie and review it in your mind. Close your eyes and relax. Watch the movie. But with everything that you remember, have in yourself the question, was I acting from selfishness or compassion? With each thought that you see, with each feeling, with each sensation, consider them from that point of view. How did I act today? And when you find things that you want to change, meditate on those further and commit to yourself to not repeat those mistakes. And if you persist in this practice every day, setting the aspiration in the morning, reviewing your day at night, do it every day. Little by little, you will start to see a change. There's a story related to this that's told of a great sage from ages past who did exactly this practice. But because he didn't trust himself and his own memory and his own mind, he decided that he would do it and rely on a little pile of stones to help him. So he gathered some black stones and some white stones. And as he sat in his meditation and reviewed his day, each time he found an event, a thought, a feeling that he knew was wrong, that was harmful to himself or someone else, he would take a black stone and set it in a little pile. And any time he found a good action, a good thought, or a good feeling, something truly selfless, selfless and compassionate, he would take a white stone and make a pile. Now, as you probably expect, in the beginning, there were no white stones in the pile. It was all black stones. But that sage took that so seriously that each day when he set his aspiration, he would watch himself carefully. And little by little, white stones began to appear in the pile. Till after years of practice, great deal of effort, no more black stones appeared. And he had created in himself bodhicitta as a work of will. We can aspire to, to follow that example. The remainder of this course will delve very deeply into two primary sources, the Christian Gospels, to examine the path of the bodhisattva in detail. So many of the things that we discuss today will be elaborated upon and explained in much more detail. And secondly, we'll look into the Bodhicharya Vatara, which is that book by Shanti Deva called The Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. It could be said that that's the most important book of Tibetan Buddhism. And the Christian Gospels, of course, the most important books of Christianity. Both of these documents express the same teaching, which is the path of the Bodhisattva. The work that we would have to do to follow in the example of these great teachers and to once and for all transcend suffering. Do you have any questions? Very good question. Those who choose the spiral path make a mistake. Not in choosing that path, because sometimes it's necessary. And I say that because the one who really needs to make that decision is the being, the internal Buddha, not the aspirant, not the human soul. And so there are cases in which that being needs to take that path. So I have in no way want to criticize that choice. But there is, nonetheless, oftentimes a mistake that's made by the human soul in which they believe 
that those powers and those bodies are their real self. That's a mistake. Because it is not. So the nirvanis and pratyekas become attached to powers, to having those kinds of experiences, conscious experiences. The bodhisattva, on the other hand, because of the nature of bodhicitta itself, which is conscious love, but remember the other aspect of that bodhicitta, absolute bodhicitta, is the recognition of Buddha nature, but it's also the comprehension of the absolute, of the emptiness in all things. So a person who has bodhicitta well-developed spontaneously comprehends that those bodies and those powers are also empty of self-nature. They do not become attached. Therefore, in that sense, it's an easy renunciation to make because the bodhisattva knows these don't belong to me anyway. Why should I be attached to them? Why should I grasp at having some fancy-sounding name, to having powers or vestures or you know, in, uh, initiations? Those all belong to the being anyway. They don't belong to the initiate. They belong to God. The bodhisattva who makes that choice, who renounces nirvana, renounces the powers, and chooses to serve the Christ, then will incarnate that force. Those capacities, the bodies, the powers, the consciousness, are, were all along the property of the being anyway. But now they will be used by the Christ to help others. This means that the bodhisattva, in that sense, still has powers, still has the bodies, but does not ex exert personal will over them. Does that make sense? They may or may not have access to them, depending on the stage of the process that they're in. But the being always uses them. The Christ will use them, sometimes without the bodhisattva even knowing. And there are cases, stories about different masters who would appear in multiple places at the same time having the power of ubiquity. This is related to that. So any other questions? Yes. Is it possible for a person to become Buddha through another bodhicitta? Yes. Any being can develop bodhicitta. However, not all the Pratyeka Buddhas have bodhicitta. They might, they might not. But a bodhisattva must have it because that is the basis of the bodhisattva path. The bodhisattva is created inside of the atmosphere of the bodhicitta. It is like a, a womb in the consciousness. It's, a, it's an environment of energy whose nature is conscious love. And the bodhisattva is the expression of that. Bodhicitta means awakened mind wisdom mind. Bodhisattva is the essence of wisdom, so it is the expression of bodhicitta. Any other questions? The development of bodhicitta is not some future thing. The awakening of the consciousness does not happen in the future. It's now. There is no future. All that exists is this moment. If you have that aspiration to develop the consciousness, to awaken the consciousness, and you have concern for the suffering of others, then act on it now in your attitude, in the way you manage your thinking, in the way you respond to the feelings that arise in your heart, in the way you respond to the sensations you feel in your body. The nature of Tantra is a science to transform energy. In each moment, we're receiving energy of many kinds, both from inside and from outside. 
The first part of tantrism is to take the energies that we have inside, sexual energies, emotional energies, mental energies, and utilize bodhicitta to make those energies useful for others. And we also need to take the energies that are coming from outside and transform them in the same way. This is very challenging to learn how to receive the unpleasant manifestations of others with gratitude, with love. To reply with wisdom, not aggression, not anger, not pride, not resentment, not envy. Wisdom. This is something that we all begin now and should learn to sustain continually with whatever experiences arise in life. I'll give you an example. A good way to, to cultivate bodhicitta and to cultivate self-awareness is to approach your day like this. Imagine that every being that exists is a Buddha, except you. Everyone, every creature, every existing person, animal, plant, mineral, is already awakened, is only here to show you yourself. So when someone comes to you and is yelling at you, screaming at you, accusing you of this and that, or treating you badly, or they're coming to you and treating you very well, giving you praise, telling you how great you are, reflect in your mind this person is trying to teach me something about myself. Don't be hypnotized by the experiences of life. In a way, one thing they express in Tibetan Buddhism that's quite useful is they say you should treat your existence as if you are an illusion. Because really you are. If you learn to experience life as though you are an illusion, that this self is illusory, the body is illusory. It helps to break that hypnosis of the mind, to give you the capacity to utilize the consciousness as a wedge, to break open the, the habitual transformation of impressions, and to learn to transform things consciously, cognizantly, with love. That's bodhicitta. It's not simply to do it for your own welfare but also for the welfare of those you interact with and for the welfare of those you don't even see. Your actions affect people you don't even see. Meditate on that. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.